It's the call no one wants to make, but most of us at one point or another will find ourselves in an emergency. And a lot of what you do after that 911 call and before help arrives matters. In fact, it could save a life. That's why today we're bringing you the first aid tricks that ER doctors wish you knew. And to join me are two doctors that I know I'd want treating me in an emergency room, at right, any crisis, emergency medicine docs, Samson Davis and Jake Deutsch. So Dr. Davis, how important is what the family does with patients, friends do right after the emergency is identified. That handling is critical. Yeah, the first thing we say in the hospital, you stop and you check your pulse. Because <laughs> right. the, the emergency is such a shock that it kind of throws you into kind of panic overdrive, but time matters. So let's get to the first aid tricks that ER doctors wish you knew. This is the first emergency. 911 emergency. My friend, she cut herself on a knife while cooking and is bleeding heavily. She's losing a lot of blood. Help! How do you stop someone who's wounded from losing too much blood? Let me give you a number here. It's going to blow your mind. 350,000 people enter the emergency room from kitchen knife accidents alone every year. That's a lot. So how do you tell if a wound requires a trip to the hospital and what you should do for first aid in the meantime? It's difficult because usually it's a bloody fill. When you have a cut with a knife or a puncture wound, there's blood all over, so you panic as well. <laughs> but the first thing to do is to address the wound. Pressure, pressure, pressure. So usually I take a gauze or a towel, whatever you have, yeah. and if this is the wound here, I put pressure here. Make sure you try to keep the wound and the fill as clean as possible. Mm -hmm. So once the bleeding stops, it will stop with the pressure if it's a small enough wound. Then you can look at it to see if it's a small cut, a small abrasion, or if it's a gaping wound. You know, wounds that are deeper than sort of the skin level usually require sutures. So if any doubt at all, make sure you come to the emergency If department. you see a little white there, yellow, that's the fat beneath the, level, the top level, that needs to be closed over. And if you wait too long, then we can't close it anymore. That's right. Don't delay. But why would you wait? All right, let's say you put pressure on here, like you said, and then you peek back, what, in five minutes? I think five minutes okay. is a good enough time. You peek back, it's still bleeding. You do it again, it's still bleeding. Third time, 15 minutes later, it's still bleeding. You gotta get more aggressive because you probably hit something. Why first, why would that happen? Well, you worry about an artery. Like you may hit a major vessel and a major vessel, you gotta think of it as like a fire hose. It's gonna keep pumping, pumping that fluid, yeah. pumping that blood out of the wound. So you wanna make sure you do a, a maneuver to sort of stop the pressure. So one of the good tricks is using a tourniquet here. Tourniquet? Yeah, tourniquet. It's a scary so term. We're lucky we have one here, but this we could we could take the tourniquet. If you don't have one, you can use other items at home, like a towel, you can use a belt, but you wanna put the tourniquet on here and you just wanna pull. Let's just roll that around like that. Okay, so let's say you got a deeper cut like this. And so you pull here, and the goal is to stop the bleeding. You don't want to bleed out, so you want to stop the bleeding. So you pull it tight, and you tie here for, for you twist here for added added pressure. So pressure stops the bleeding from occurring, from uh, happening, and the person from bleeding out, and that's very important. So you can use a towel, you can use a belt, anything that could create a tourniquet to stop the hemorrhaging from happening. This is really tight. That little twisting motion you can do, which you point out with a towel. Uh, you don't have to have one of these fancy dancy tourniquets. Although having one of these at home, which I now have probably a worthwhile endeavor. Absolutely. Yeah. Belt you can also do, pull up tight and then twist the top of it, you make it tighter. Now, let's take a listen to our next emergency. 911 emergency. We were eating and my husband just started choking. I don't know what to do. I, I don't think he's breathing. Help. Choking is the fourth leading cause of unintentional injury death in the United States. Many people know they should know the Heimlich maneuver, but they don't actually know quite how to do it, so they don't step up in the crisis. So walk us through how I can save someone's life if they're choking. First of all, the universal sign. Yes, be able to identify that, of course. Right. right, but that's pretty obvious. But then the Heimlich is just a simple maneuver by using your fists, mm -hmm. grasping it tightly, and using the correct upward pressure in order to dislodge the foreign body. So what are you doing specifically? You're trying to force the air in the lung through the windpipe? Yeah, you're basically compressing the diaphragm, and by putting that pressure on the diaphragm, you're then expelling the object through the esophagus. All right, so let's say I'm coming in here, you see me like this, and you ask me how am I doing, and I say, I'm, I'm fine, I got something in my throat. You do right. the Heimlich? No, if somebody's able to speak, air is moving, so you don't want to use the Heimlich maneuver in that situation. But if they can't make a sound, they're obviously choking. So then you want to make sure you get the correct position. You're going to fasten your fist underneath, just like that, and you're going to push in an upward direction very firmly. And you want to do it at least five times or until you see that something has come out. And what if, uh, what if they get pain there after you've done it? Well, I mean, that's the least of the problems. If you <laughs> prevented them from choking to death, a it's little pain news. is fine. I always say, yeah. you complain about the pain, thank goodness you're alive. Yes, exactly. All right. Now, what if they're, obviously, 
you're, you're a big guy, but some of the right. viewers are smaller women. It may be difficult for them. You may not be able to get your arm around. Or they're slumped over a chair because often it happens when you're eating, right? right. So sitting at a table. So what do you do then? So then you're going to have somebody in a prone position laying down if they've passed out as well. This is something uh, that you could use as an approach. And basically, you're going to straddle the person rather than come behind them. So we'll sort of give you a little example here. Roll them on their back. Make sure that they're on their back, head is facing away from you, and you're gonna use the same approach. So you're gonna just get underneath that xiphoid here and the sternum, and you're gonna press upward, and same idea, so that you're gonna expel the foreign body through the esophagus. Okay, now if you're by yourself, let me demonstrate this. This is my specialty. I've always wondered what would I do if I'm eating by myself, which happens. <laughs> so you can sit, behave yourself by similar concept. You're forcing air through your lungs. Make a fist, this your own fist, just like Dr. Jake showed us. Put that fist the, on a chair, and you can come down to your navel. By the way, the thumb side should be towards the navel part of your body and push in on your own just to get to the right spot. Then sit on top of the chair and then, you know, you're not gonna be able to do this too often. So a couple times forcefully, <laughs> for, put, you know, fall on top of your fist. You'll expel whatever breath's in your lungs. And then finally, when the, pulse, uh, the piece of material comes out, you'll be able to get a little bit of air in there until someone else can, can come to help you. All right, let's get to our next emergency. 911 emergency. Yeah, hey, it's my sister. I think she's having an allergic reaction. She's not breathing. Can you help us? Help. Each year, 200,000 people require emergency care for allergic reactions to food. Well, what's likely happening to somebody if they've eaten the wrong thing or they got stung by a bee or something and they have an anaphylactic allergic reaction? Exactly. Anaphylaxis is what we're talking about, and that's when you have a severe allergic reaction and there's inflammatory process that's occurring. These histamines get released in our body, massive amount of them, and that causes difficulty breathing, airway constriction. Mm -hmm. So that's really what's happening in that process. All right, so you, you pa you're passing out, people can see it happening to you right in front of their eyes. What's the first thing you should do if someone's having that? Is to react. So obviously don't underestimate how serious and how quickly this can escalate. Make sure that you're calling 911 immediately, and then try to determine if the person has any sort of epinephrine, a device to help reverse the reaction. All right, so we always administer epinephrine, and there's a little phrase we remember, blue to the sky, orange to the thigh, because the device, as you see on the screen, uh, has one side that you're supposed to you know, aim away from the patient, the other side's gotta go into their thigh. Show us if you can, if you, have, you have a little demonstration. This is not a real one, so it doesn't have the same colors. But. Exactly, so this is a demo model, but if you'll see, there's a red side, and that's gonna indicate what you're going to be putting to the body, and you're gonna make sure that you get a very large area, the surface area of the muscle, so the thigh is a good place, and you're gonna put it on the thigh and then press in. And it's key that you're gonna hold it for three seconds, because you wanna make sure that all the medication is delivered. Right. There's a needle on the end of this, right? So a very sharp needle. Right, so it's, you know, your first instinct is not to hold it in, but right. you have to wait till the entire injector epi empties epinephrine. And again, being prepared, you want to make sure that you're not going to get your finger because that could be very serious injury to the digits. Yes, not, please. Big area, you mentioned yeah. that. Yeah, right. Whatever's close. But up next, more first aid tricks, including how I recently was involved in a life-saving endeavor at Newark Airport. This is a skill you all need to know. We're back with more first aid tricks. ER docs wish you knew. Next one, I had to actually recently use myself. Take a look. Last year, just after I landed at Newark Airport with Lisa and our daughter, Arabella, a man at baggage claim passed out and fell to the ground. He was having a heart attack. Arabella came on the show and talked about what happened next. It was terrifying. Uh, his family was around him. They were watching him lose his life. He was turning blue. Um, he had no pulse. So I remember hearing your voice, Daddy, Daddy. So I turned around and I saw that this gentleman had, had collapsed and his head had hit the ground. There was a, a puddle of blood, actually, that I could see. A passerby caught the scene as I worked with first responders giving chest compressions, and we were able to revive the man. I think the most surprising moment was when I saw his hand move back up to his face. I, I think I, like, impulsively applauded. <laughs> I couldn't, I just couldn't believe that he had come back to life. Well, I'm happy to report that I recently checked in with Joe and his wife, Barbara, and both his cardiologist and primary physician had given him a good bill of health, and his heart is doing great. So CPR works. It really does. Dr. Sapson Davis is back. How much time does someone have to to get revived if they've actually had what Joe had, complete collapse when the heart stops? Ideally, four to five minutes is somewhat the threshold where the heart is irreversible damage, but the sooner you jump in and take action, the better the chance that your loved one will survive. Listen, you're not always gonna be lucky enough to have a heart surgeon at your emergency. So by the end of this segment, I want everyone watching at home to know exactly what this is that I'm holding, right? What this baby is, right? How to arm it, 
uh, and, you know, and use it appropriately. Give you the tools that you need to save a life so you can feel empowered. It doesn't take longer than this segment to teach you that. Let's start with Nina. She's worried, like many of you, that she would panic in emergency. Why is that? You know, I've never taken a CPR class, so I really don't know what to do. And um, you just, I feel like I, you just don't know how you're going to react when something happens. Okay, so let's walk through step-by-step step exactly how to respond when someone's having a heart attack. So Dr. Davis, the first thing to do. The first thing you want to do if they're lying there on the ground, you want to get down next to them. And you just want to tap them lightly. Annie, are you okay? Annie, are you okay? And you want to see if they respond to you. Okay. And if they don't, then you want to sort of take your fingers, your two fingers here, you can see, feel on the side of the neck to see if you feel the pulse. And you can always take your ear and put to their mouth. And then feel if they're breathing, you feel any air being exchanged. And if not, then you have to take action. Next. Okay. You got to assign someone to call 911. You don't just say, help, get some help, get some help. That doesn't work, right? right? Pick someone out there. Say, hey, you right there in the green sweater, I want you calling 911. And that way, you're free to take care of the patient. So I'll be the person in the green sweater. I'll go get some help. I'm also going to get an AED because that's pretty critical. An AED will make a huge difference. They're located in most public places. Look for signs like this, right? And they, Dr. Davis, I'll run to get the AED. You teach Dino what to do until it gets back. So, Nina, once you feel that they're unresponsive, you don't feel any air, you want to start chest compressions. Then it's simply you're taking the palm of your hand and you're taking your other hand and you're interlocking as such. And you just want to put it right between the, uh, the chest here, right between the two nipples here, and you just want to press as such. And by doing so, you're, you're circulating the blood to the brain because you, the brain is starving of oxygen because the heart is a pumping. So you're pretty much acting as an artificial pump by pumping on the chest there. And, Nina, what if you press so hard that you break the chest bone? I don't know. Well, they're still alive to complain about it, so it's a success story. Okay. But don't hesitate. Don't be, you know, soft and fuzzy about chest compressions. You're pushing blood to the brain. Okay. So push forcefully the way that Samson did. All right, okay. next, I got the AED. I'm finally back. So I'll open this baby up. It's literally as simple as this. You, as you open it, there's a pad in here. It's going to say, take the pad out. Go ahead, Samson. Remove square package from lid of AED. All right, you, so you saw it say that. I'm going to, just for the, my own sanity... So unwrap that, you pat them exactly where they need to be. There's literally a picture on top of the pad. You can see it here. The picture tells you exactly where the pads go. The machine, meanwhile, is auditing whether the pads are in the right place, looking at the EKG, preparing to shock the patient. Eventually, it's going to say, clear the patient. Now, it's now telling you, get away. Don't touch the patient. There's no way you can hurt yourself or the patient. It will tell you to get away, and it will only shock the patient if it knows for sure that the heart rhythm is not appropriate and they can play a role in helping. Then there's a little red button here that will start to blink. You push the button like that, and it's going boom, it's like, the, like in the movies. That's what happened when we were in Newark with that patient a few months ago. Okay. Patient jumps off the floor. It shocks the heart back into rhythm. The next thing you know, patient starts to breathe. As Samson pointed out, once you hear the breathing there, you can stop your chest compressions. They'll push you away anyway. You won't let you do chest compressions while they're alive. <laughs> And if you see signs of life, for that reason, you can start celebrating. Obviously, 911 hopefully will be there pretty soon. Get him in the ambulance, or Dr. Davis is waiting with a smile at the other end of the ambulance. Absolutely. Okay, great. I, I feel so much more educated. Right, Dr. Davis, as always, appreciate having you here.